You may be seated. And in your copy of God's Word, then this morning, let's return to First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Our text has been from verse 2 to verse 10, and so far in our study we have covered verses 2 to 4, and today we'll pick up the study from verse 5. But before we do that, I want to begin by helping you to see and to understand the force of verse 5, because that's where we left off last week, to see the force of verse 5. In verse 5 you will see that conjunction because or the phrase for is clear to see. And it answers the how we know of verse 4. Remember in verse 4 we looked at last week, Paul says, we know that you are loved by God and we know for sure that you are elected by God because that's how verse 5 begins. This is why what Paul says. We know that you are loved and elected because of the following. But I want to challenge you then and ask you, is it the how we know that you are loved and elected, both of them? Or does Paul only emphasize election? Does he say, I know that you are loved and elected because of this? Or if you look at verse 4, knowing brethren beloved by God, his choice for you or your election. We know of your election because is it only pulling and emphasizing the election part or the loved and elected together? And I take it to answer the how of the election primarily, not only. Because that election encompasses the love. You're loved, elected, elected, loved. The elected are the loved and the beloved, but I believe that the Apostle Paul zooms in on the election that we see at the end of verse 4, while not excluding the love aspect, but he's going to emphasize election. And last week I equipped you then, and even the first time we started studying, with tools to enrich you in your Bible studying. And I want to aid you Uh, with more tools uh, as we study today's text and next week and the following weeks, Lord willing. But one of the tools then to give you this morning to help you to understand the text better is to understand the author's style of writing because the biblical authors don't all write the same. They have different styles. And if you understand the style of the author, it makes it easy for you to understand the logic and the meaning. And if if you get that and get into grips with how the author reasons. You will get much from the author. In fact, I want you to hear what Paul says. If you turn to Second Thessalonians, the last chapter, and verse 17, just ten, two pages or so, you'll see that this is something Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. Paul says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark in every letter of mine. That is the implication. And then he says, this is the way I write. So Paul says, I want you to know how I write. Because there were fake letters that were sent, letters claiming to be from the apostles, and they were troubling the church, and the church was troubled when Paul wrote Second Thessalonians. But Paul says to them, but you know how I write. So even if somebody brings a letter and says it comes from Paul, you should know from the way this letter is written that this isn't me. And so if you know Paul, and if you know any other author, it helps you to understand how they write. You can go back to First Thessalonians then. But the same applies to the preachers of the gospel as we preach uh, from the pulpit. If you understand the preacher's preaching style, you will get more out of it. And here at the church a few years ago, when we were studying the core values of our church, I taught that 
we have essentially two types of thinkers in the congregation. Uh, those who are wired to think descriptively and those who are wired to think prescriptively. Well, God has blessed me with a descriptive wife and I'm wired as a prescriptive thinker. And the same applies to our children. Tigva is prescriptive, Warona is descriptive. But we can still live in harmony, which is the amazing, beautiful thing about this. Even though we may be different, we can live together. And the same applies here at the church. There are those who think prescriptively and those who think descriptively. And then preachers also preach the way they are wired. And so we have to understand all of those things. But I will not get into the details of all of that. Um, If you want to study uh, that sermon, I can give you the sermon that I preached uh, a while ago. And as I said, it comes from the core values of our, of our church on logic and reason. But this means then that you will have to primarily understand us as we preach. And we also have to understand you, the audience, as we prepare to preach to you uh, so that we may get much from the sermon. But now as a prescriptive Uh, teacher then or preacher, one of the things to know about me, to understand me as you listen to my sermons, is to understand that I'm I'm not a big picture thinking type person, and I have respect for people who are able to do that. When I think about a text, I, I, of course, we should have the big picture of the whole Bible, the whole story of redemption, because it's important to know and see how a redemptive story unfolds. As you study your text, you have to see how it is well knit. You have to see how it is cohesive. Even if you get stuck in a text somewhere, you have to know what is this text doing here and how does it fit with the rest of the story of redemption. But I zoom in on the details, but I still have to understand what the story is. And so I like exhausting the text in front of us. And so I'm going to ask you to fix your eyes on the text that is in front of you uh, this morning. Now, the Apostle Paul then talks about election in our text. And as I said, I believe from verse 4, as he ends there, he talks about the choice of the believers. And then he talks about election. He says, I know that God has chosen you I know that God has elected you. And we saw last week that this choosing or this election is election for salvation. But if you were to say to another believer, I know for sure that you are elected, and they asked you, how do you know that I am elected and chosen or saved? What would you say? How would you answer them? Well, Paul has given us some evidences of grace to testify to, or that testify to the professed salvation uh, that we have already seen. But in our text this morning, verses 5 to 7, we won't get to verse 7, but verse 5 to verse 7, he gives us three ways to know that you are elected. So if you want to know whether you are elected, there are three ways to know whether you are elected. And once you know this, and once we see this in the text, this should cause us to thank God because we still have not moved away from what Paul wants us to do in verse 2. He says, we give thanks to God always for you. And he gives thanks for all the things that are done beneath verse 2 to verse 10. And so today he zooms in on, on election then. Three ways to know that you are elected so that you may give thanks to God for the gospel that has saved you. The first way to know is how the gospel came to you in verse 5. If you look at verse 5, Paul says, we know for sure that you elected because of how the gospel came. It came not in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. And the second way to know that you are elected is because of how the gospel's transforming power, the renewing power of the gospel, 
has made you imitators of gospel preachers and of the Lord Jesus himself. In verse 6a, Paul says, we know that you have also become imitators of us and of the Lord. And that further solidifies our knowledge or our conviction that you are elected and saved. And then lastly, we know that you are elected because of how you accepted the gospel. How? You accepted it in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And that we see in verse 6b. You became imitators of us. You have, have received the word of the Lord in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And because of how you accepted it, then we know you are elected. But let's read then from verse 2 to verse 10. I hope that we see the flow of the reasoning. Let's read then from verse 2 to verse 10 and then get into the text to unpack it. Paul then says, God says to us through the mouth of Paul, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, just as you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Lord, we hear your words and We pray that you would help us, Lord, as we look closely at verse 5 and verse 6 to see, Lord, how you have elected us. What amazing love that is that you have shown us. And, Lord, we pray that you would cause us to then give thanks to you for this gospel of election. And that ultimately, Lord, as we see in the passage, that you would make us, uh, make us examples to other believers to observe our conduct and how, Lord, we serve you as true believers. We ask that you, by your spirit, then illumine um, your word, our minds, and help us to grasp the truth of your word and write these eternal truths on our hearts to the young and the old. In Jesus' name. Amen. This is a really easy to understand text. I hope that you uh, believe the same because the the flow and the logic is easy as I tried my best to explain. And as I said, if you understand Paul's logic, if you understand the preacher's logic, uh, the, the meaning of the words that you see will be illumined by the Holy Spirit. If you understand how the author reasons, the words and their meaning then make sense. But Paul says to the Thessalonians then that we know that God has elected you for salvation. He's loved you and elected you for salvation because our gospel did not come to you in word only. He says we know that the gospel, the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ who is crucified for your sins that we preached to you because we preached this gospel. We preached that we are sinners who deserve the wrath of God. 
And because we are born fallen and we have sinned much, have worshipped idols, we have missed the mark of salvation. It was only the gospel that could bring hope that has been preached to you. And so Paul says, we preach this gospel to you, that Christ was crucified for your sins. You deserved to die, but he died in your place. And we preach this gospel. And this gospel has produced visible results. So we know, in verse 5 he says, that it did not come in just that preaching only, but we know that it has produced results. Now the results that Paul talks about, besides the evidences that is already mentioned, are the ones that he talks about here, pertaining to election specifically, in verse 5. He says, the first is that it came in power. That is the first evidence of the gospel, or to know that you are elected, because the gospel came to you in power, and it came in the Holy Spirit with full assurance. Those three show us that you are elected. Now, the question then to ask yourself or to jot down if you're taking notes to think about is this. When the Apostle Paul talks about these three, you have to ask yourself where the power, the Holy Spirit, and the assurance seen in the Thessalonians, for Paul to say we know that you're elected because we see faith, uh, because we see the, the, the power of the, of the Holy Spirit at work and we see your conviction. And if so, can you identify those in context? Or where the power that Paul is talking about, the Holy Spirit, and conviction seen in Paul, Timothy, and Slivanus. And in that way, then Paul knows that the believers are elected. And if you say that they are seen in Paul, Timothy, and Slivanus, uh, how so? How do we see the power, the Holy Spirit, and conviction in either of them, if you were to pick one? Well, I believe that it was in Paul and his companions. And let me show you in the text again why I believe that the power, Holy Spirit, full conviction that Paul talks about to say that he knows that you are chosen, that we have to say, I know that you are chosen this morning, should be seen in those who brought the message. Let me show you from the text. And again, as I said um, two weeks ago, the, the ESV and the NIV, unfortunately, don't help us again in this text to understand here. But if you have text like the, the New King James, translation like the New King James, the New American Standard Bible, or some translations, you will see help that is given there for you. After that phrase, if you look at that phrase in verse 5, with full assurance, because he ends with that. He says, we know that the gospel did not come in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, with full conviction. And then the ESV or the NIV would say, you also became imitators, or, or, or you know what kind of men we proved to be among you. But there's a phrase that is dropped out, which is important. And the phrase is the phrase, just as. And so if you are bold enough, you can add it in your translation, that after the full conviction, there should be just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And if you add the phrase, just as, which I, I, I uh, hope that it wasn't dropped. But if it had not been dropped, then the, the verse or the flow from verse 4 would read as follows. And here would be the logic then. And think of just as, and, as in your Bible. Paul would be saying then from verse 4, we know that you are elected, beloved. Because our gospel did not come to you in word only. But it also came in power. And you saw that power. It also came 
in the Holy Spirit. And Brighton will wake up and hear the rest of what's happening here. It came in the Holy Spirit, he says. And then, with full assurance. And then, just as. So, those three, just as you saw them in us. That's what Paul would be saying. So that phrase, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. We prove to be men who did not just bring the, the word, the gospel in word only, but we brought it in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. And that is what you imitated then in the next verse. That's how the next verse would make sense, if you follow the logic. But it still goes both ways. We know that you elected and the gospel did not come to you in vain. I already told you what the evidence is, Paul says, that I see in you. But if you look at our conduct as well, as preachers of the gospel, it solidifies what we know about you. Because as you saw the power in us, and as you saw the Holy Spirit in us, and as you saw the full assurance in us, these three proved what kind of men we are. It proved that we are true gospel preachers. And if you saw these three in us, then that shows that our gospel is effective. It is the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It shows that we are sent by him to proclaim the gospel that rescues people from the wrath of God to come. And after seeing that, and seeing that it, we believed it with true conviction, that proves then that you can rely on that gospel. And if you do trust it and rely on it, you will be elected. But it does not end there because verse 6 says, And we further know then that you became imitators of us in the power, the Holy Spirit, conviction, but not of us only, but of the Lord himself by accepting the word and this is the how part of this in verse 6b by accepting the word the word came and as it came you saw that it came with these three things and and you saw that what it cost it cost us paul is saying because to follow christ is costly you have to count the cost and it wasn't easy for Paul, Timothy, and Slivanus. And that is why when they were among the Thessalonians, their life that they lived was tough. And I'll mention a little bit later, reminding you about Timothy, as I said. There's a reason why Paul mentions Timothy there. And once you see that this is this gospel that comes with much tribulation, yet in it there's power, in it there's joy, in tribulation and then the believers then in verse 6b imitated that accepted the gospel also with much affliction and with the joy of the holy spirit so they took this gospel that came with affliction and they accepted it with joy and that joy is the joy of the holy spirit and so Paul is saying, you saw the power in us. You saw the Holy Spirit in us. You saw full conviction. They prove what kind of men we are. And you imitated that. Meaning as you saw and had the word of God, you saw and had its power. Because the power lies in the message about the crucified Christ who is able to turn hearts of stone into hearts of flesh to give people eternal life and to rescue people from the wrath to come. You accepted that gospel. That's the power of the gospel. With the Holy Spirit. And full conviction and you imitated us. And by so imitating us, you imitated the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we imitate Christ. We don't come to you and expect you to imitate us if you don't imitate the Lord. We imitate the Lord. And for that, God must be thanked. And this is the Lord who suffered 
Because the gospel that Paul preached is the gospel of the Lord who suffered for the gospel. And Paul says the Thessalonian believers accepted this gospel that comes with suffering. And now that these things are things that we see, that we should see in a believer to say whether the believer is elected or saved, as it were, that should be seen in you if you are elected. It should be seen in you then that you have heard the gospel and you have accepted it. If you want to test whether you are a believer, you have to say, I have accepted the gospel. That's the first step. You hear it by faith. And Paul has already talked about their faith, if you remember. He's already talked about that. It starts there. You've accepted it by faith. You responded by faith. Second, you have accepted with the joy of the Holy Spirit. It, g- it gave you joy. And those are the markers that we look at to say, this person now has joy. And we know that you have joy, and this joy we know that it is of the Holy Spirit, because even in much affliction, you still have that joy. That's what Paul is saying. Now, I want to argue in closing, agreeing with John Piper on agreeing with John Piper on the interpretation of this passage, that joy alone in the gospel, if somebody receives the gospel, if you hear the gospel preached, if you hear the word preached and you accept it, and then we see joy externally, somebody appearing to be responding in faith, that joy alone is not evidence that you are saved. That's what I want to argue this morning. That joy of the Holy Spirit isn't proof that you are elected and saved. But I believe what Paul is saying in the text is that if you have that joy of the Holy Spirit in much affliction, during trials, troubling times, persecution, intense suffering, very long suffering, then that proves that you are elected. So if you look at verse 6 then, uh, if you read it going backwards, you say that you have the joy of the Holy Spirit even in much tribulation as you received the gospel and you became imitators of people who were suffering at the time because when Paul, Timothy, Levanus brought the gospel at that time they were suffering and as I said, remember Timothy was facing persecution from his church at Ephesus and there were troubling people who raised themselves up to call themselves elders who were not qualified to lead and they were giving Timothy trouble in the church at Ephesus Timothy was timid. He was even afraid of some of the people in the congregation. And remember we saw Paul said, no, do not be afraid. You're not given the spirit of timidity. You should never be afraid of any individual. That is why even as I said in the opening from Psalm 27, that Psalm that we prayed together is to say, Lord, help us to stand firm even when enemies face us. When enemies face us, help us to still stand firm and in your temple, the temple language spoken there. Let none of the enemies, whether they may be in the church or out of the church, let none of the troubles of life, whatever they may be, cause us to depart from the joy that we have in the gospel. And if you have that joy during that time, then you saw proof to be elected. And Timothy was suffering much, and Paul said, be strong. Stand up against these people. Rebuke them. He said, even rebuke even the elders, those who teach publicly, so that others may fear and know that the house of the Lord should be honored. And no person who dishonors the Lord 
should be allowed to dishonor the Lord in the congregation. And Slevanus also was suffering greatly, which is why he's also mentioned. And Paul, of course, we know about his sufferings. We know that he would die for this gospel. But I want to end here today. And next week then, spend all of next week's sermon focusing on how, if I say that I believe the text says joy in suffering proves that you are elected, I want to spend time next week looking just at that, to go deeper into that, to see how joy in suffering proves whether you are elected or not, and how it shows that God's power is at work in you and how it shows that you are truly saved and that you have assurance as a believer. And I want to further show from Scripture, and I will show you from passages of Scripture, some that will be in Thessalonians and some that will be in other parts of the Bible, that joy alone, as I said, is not proof of election. Of salvation but suffering persecution affliction hardship distress those are things that if you have while well, you have joy keeping your joy those are the things that show whether you are saved or not there are those who associate with the believers and they they believe that they will be legitimized by association they come to church and then think that if they come to church and speak christian language and speak bible verses and associate with us and sometimes they even take membership in a gospel church that proves that they are saved it doesn't we study together hebrews chapter 6 that says that some may even experience the holy spirit's work and still fall away and that shows that they were never truly saved There are those who appear to love the Lord. They talk about loving the Lord. They love the Lord when they have riches. But when those riches are taken away and when suffering comes, they leave the Lord and so prove that they never really loved the Lord or belonged to him. Don't we sing here at church, and I will refer to that song. There's a song that we sing that says, Lord, if I... Rescue me. If I cling to the riches that I have, quickly take them from my grasp. Do you really believe that? Do we really say we want to count the cost and we have and we will follow the Lord? And if we have food and clothing, with that we will be content. The Lord knows what we need. Are we prepared to be those kinds of Christians? There are those as well who generally experience much affliction as well. And then when they are afflicted or when suffering comes, they also leave the Lord. So you have those who enjoy riches of life or who pursue riches. If they never reach those riches or if the riches go away, they leave the Lord. And there are those who, even if they do not have riches, but when suffering of all kinds comes, then they depart from the Lord. Those prove to have never belonged to him in the first place. They prove to not have been his disciples. But as I said, those who in great, plentiful, and very long suffering of life, if they keep the gospel, and if they still have joy in the gospel, those are the ones who prove to be elected. Remember the parable of the sower or the parable of the four soils? Remember Jesus' words on the rich young ruler and what he said to the rich young ruler? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you this morning that you have elected your people. And that, Lord, we know that we live in a difficult world and we live, Lord, tempted and tried and tested daily to choose between you and to choose between 
the riches of this world, to choose between you and the comforts of this world, those idol things, things we idolize. Lord, what do we pursue in life? Are we fully sold for you? Will we walk with you when it is tough? Lord, are we truly those described in the Pilgrim's Progress, that our sanctification comes with difficulty? Oh Lord, we pray that you would prepare us then to be those who would say that we are not standing because of our own strength, even though there, is, there are difficulties in life. This is the power of the gospel. It shows its effect in our lives. Help us those to, say, to be those who say that we see the Holy, the Holy Spirit at work in us because he's causing the word of Christ to dwell richly in us, to, for us not to depart from it even if there are trials and testings. Satan tempted Jesus with the riches and of this world, but Jesus stood firm. Help us, Lord, to be imitators of the Lord. Your servants, Lord, were tested and tried and, and, and things taken from them. And the church in Antioch in Acts chapter 11 was persecuted, Lord, and they had to flee. And that's how you even spread the gospel. They did not depart from you. Help us to be those who, Lord, give our all to you. Even as we've just sung this morning, that we love you, Lord. You are, you are all and the best and all we need. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to know, even if we have riches, how to use them to advance the kingdom. Because it is true what we sing, that, Lord, you do not count how much we give, but, Lord, you look at how much we keep. If, Lord, we give little to you and keep much for ourselves, help us, Lord, to be rescued and to give our all to you, to be sold fully for Christ. Lord, help us to serve you in spirit and in truth, knowing, Lord, that if we do not, there will be wrath to come. And, Lord, we want to be those who will escape the wrath because we will not be able to withstand your just fury, your just wrath poured on us. But help us, Lord, to trust in Christ who has absorbed the full wrath of God. And help us to trust in him, Lord, until you return, even though this journey may be tough and long. In Jesus' name, amen.